Maybe your stomach is rumbling on a road trip or you're just a little tight on time. Well, these classic American icons are known for speed, convenience, and consistency. And whether it's breakfast, lunch, dinner, or a midnight snack, they have got your flavor. What am I talking about? One of the most popular and tasty American food experiences, fast food. Burgers and fries, tacos, fried chicken, sandwiches, milkshakes, the options are endless. Mm. And some come with toys. The fast food industry accounts for 200,000 locations spread across the 50 states and brings in a whopping $239 billion a year. Today, I'm gonna experience what it's like mm. to work the line in one of the most iconic and oldest fast food chains, White Castle. And we're going to explore the wide world of fast food. Just how much beef does it take for this White Castle factory to keep up with the slider craze? How did In-N-Out revolutionize the drive-thru? And where can we find the only copy of KFC's secret chicken recipe? Your order is up because this is Modern Marvel's Fast Food. The story begins with a five cent burger and medieval architecture. White Castle is arguably the original American fast food restaurant. Established in 1921, White Castle started selling slider sized burgers for five cents and serving their customers with speed, getting them their food fast. White Castle has also pioneered carry out, fast food in the frozen aisle in your grocery store, and has been a cultural mainstay for decades. White Castles, those legendary hamburgers and cheeseburgers with the irresistible taste. Today, I've come to this location of White Castle here in Whitehall, Pennsylvania to see how it's all done. We'll also head to the mothership, White Castle's meat plant, where 156 million sliders are processed every year. But our fast food journey begins here, in the trenches, among the grills and the fryers, where we'll explore the modern fast food industry. The smell of meat on the griddle, sizzling onions and fries crackling to life greets you like a warm hug the moment you enter this tasty haven. I can't wait to get started. Now, this is big for me because I I'm well aware of the magic of White Castle from this side of the counter, but hopefully today you will expose me to the magic on the other side. Yes, we will. There really is nothing that tastes like White Castle. There is simply nothing like a White Castle slider. There is nothing like a White Castle clam strip, a chicken ring. That flavor keeps people coming back. I mean, I'm living proof of this. After Little League games, that was the thing we did. Right. OK, so will you show me how this magical operation works? Adam, let's get behind these castle walls and let's do it. Here's your uniform. Thank you so much. Let's get to work. My first assignment, breakfast. We're going to do the Belgium waffle, egg, and bacon cheese sandwich. Now, for those of you at home, do not attempt to adjust your dial. I'm in a white castle. This is a real egg. So every single breakfast sandwich you guys sell, you guys are cracking fresh eggs for. That's right, Adam. That is so profoundly impressive. At the scale that White Castle sells, operates, and serves clientele, it's kind of amazing to think that you guys are cracking fresh eggs. Now is the opportunity for me to completely embarrass myself, not just in front of Haskell, <laughs> but all the great hardworking people here at White Castle. Belgian waffle, bacon, egg, and cheese. We've already got our bacon ready, so we don't have to do anything there. It's going to okay. be good. And we have our trusty assistant getting those Belgian waffles in our toaster. And they actually come from Belgium. First, we oil up the griddle and crack some eggs. How do they control the heat so this isn't like a flaming, gigantic mess? The griddles we use are AccuTemps, and they're, they're set to temp. So this is set at 300, and it'll never go above or below. Meaning these cutting edge griddles are designed to keep the temperature consistent across the entire cooking surface. 
which is kind of a modern marvel unto itself because knowing that temperature control is so key and having high technology that will hold a constant temperature at every place on this griddle allows you to have that consistency and that quality at the same time. And once the eggs are perfectly cooked, voila. Okay. We have our Belgian waffles. And it's the Liege style, so it's actually a little bit more crispy. It's got the burnished sugar in it, not the sort of fluffy waffle that you might be thinking of in your mind. So you can take that first egg. Yes, sir. Right on top. Okay. All right. And then we're going to take a slice of cheese. Okay. Right on top. Yes, sir. And then we're going to take two strips of bacon. Awesome. And then we take that other Belgian waffle and put right on top of there. And then you're just going to wrap it up. And there you go. You've got the classic Belgian waffle bacon, egg, and cheese. So these things are like, like a juice box of, of real joy. It's so perfect. The White Castle box is iconic. But as with all things in life, it's what's inside that counts. And you better believe I'm going to eat this. This smells so good. It smells like everything that's right with breakfast. Come on. The best job in the world. Tell me what you think. My first thought is, why has it taken me so long to order this? <laughs> this is maybe the best first day on any job I've ever had. <laughs> but really, excellent. I think that between the quality of the waffle and the fact that it's a fresh egg, it just doesn't feel like any kind of fast food sandwich. And I think maybe that's where fast food can be its most successful when it's quick and it's convenient, yet tastes as close as possible to something you might make at home. I mean, really, this is unlike any breakfast sandwich that I could ever order from a drive-thru. This is superb. White Castle offers this beauty of a breakfast sandwich all day. And it's not the only fast food icon to make that move. In 2015, earnings jumped nearly 6% when an all-day breakfast option was introduced at the world's reigning fast food juggernaut, McDonald's. McDonald's started serving breakfast in 1970 at a franchise owned by Jim Delegati, the man who also invented a little sandwich called the Big Mac. Another franchiser, Herb Peterson, changed the breakfast game when he invented the Egg McMuffin in 1971. This iconic breakfast sandwich was developed as kind of Eggs Benedict on the go. In 1977, a breakfast menu debuted at McDonald's locations across the country, and it included hot cakes, sausage, hash browns, and English muffins. By 1986, McDonald's is said to serve one out of every four breakfasts not cooked at home in the U.S. Breakfast might be the most important meal of the day. Now you're on to the big leagues. Woo! This right. is where it all happens. But at White Castle, we've got to get ready for the lunch rush. So Adam, here you are. You're at the fry station, affectionately known as the Beast. Okay. Um, and the reason why we call it the Beast is because you'll get hit with a bunch of barrage orders, whether it's fries, mozzarella sticks, chicken rings, chicken breasts, fish, fish nibblers. It can all come at you at one time. Really? This bad boy can cook every single one of those foods to crispy perfection. If you look up, we've got some screens up here. Yeah. This is going to show you when a customer orders, all the fry items will show up here. All okay. right, so be ready for that. If you look directly straight ahead of you, the red placard are there. Yes. So you see number one says fries, number two says onion rings. So if somebody orders a fry, you come look at the fry, you hit button number one. That's for fries. Right. Button number two is for onion ring. When a food gets dropped into the oil, hitting its assigned button tells the fryer to cook it for a specific amount of time and temperature. Here we've got our fries. Yes, sir. Right? And on this side, we've got our onion rings. I'm going to yeah. keep it simple for you. Thank you I'm so I'm going to have you on the right side. Got you. And I'll let you do fries and onion rings. And I'll stay on the left side, and I'll do all the other sandwiches. Love it. And as soon as an order pops up on the overhead screen, it's time to feed the beast. Uh-oh, cool. that's on your side, Adam. OK. A sack of onion rings. Got it. Damn it, damn it. Not as easy as it looks, folks. The large 15 pieces. Two. Oh. Yep. Four. No, I want to make sure I, I, my count was right. There we go. Hit number two. There you go. It's a great feeling. The number gets called, 
and your order is ready and waiting for you at the counter. But before it gets there, your fast food has gone through an assembly line of workers all playing a part in the kitchen. It's a system designed to keep up with ferocious demand. And there is demand. McDonald's sells more than 75 hamburgers every second. Taco Bell sold a half billion Doritos Tacos Locos in a little over a single year. And a new KFC opens up somewhere in the world every six hours. The six-piece chicken ring, a three-piece mozzarella, and I gotta get the hash browns. And once the orders start... But now on your side, you're gonna make a, a french fry with cheese, and you're gonna have cheese sauce on the side as well. They don't stop. I'm telling you, look away for a second, and this fryer jumps up and bites you. It's That's terrible. why we call it the beast. The beast indeed. This well-oiled machine is a testament to how important deep fryers are for a fast food kitchen. In fact, one fast food titan built their empire on an innovative deep fryer. Kentucky Fried Chicken, home of Colonel Harlan Sanders and purveyor of a legendary chicken recipe. You know, many have tried to replicate our original recipe, Kentucky Fried Chicken, but nobody's been able to get even close to the signature recipe that fuels our 24,000 restaurants and $28 billion in business. So at the heart of our brand is Colonel Sanders. He's the founder of the brand, and he's certainly what made it incredibly successful today. The Colonel made it the world's secret recipe that you know today. Colonel Harlan Sanders started selling chicken from his service station in Corbin, Kentucky in the 1930s. Dedicated to perfection, the Colonel refined his chicken recipe until he found the perfect blend of 11 herbs and spices. The magic secret blend caught the attention of Pete Harmon, who partnered with the Colonel and opened the first location of KFC. Harmon gave the Colonel's chicken the name we know it by today, Kentucky Fried Chicken. And five years after opening the first location, Harmon also came up with its iconic slogan, finger licking good. And to get a look at how this classic chicken gets made today, we're frying up a batch with KFC corporate chef, Chris Scott. Hopefully, he'll let a secret or two slip. For me, it's really about continuing the legacy of what KFC already is. And my role is to create new and exciting dishes, drawing more customers and make people think about KFC as an innovative restaurant. Chris also experiments with new ways to improve crispiness, texture, and flavor profile across the KFC menu. We have our water bath ready to go for the breading process. KFC's original innovation is its signature fried chicken. And we're about to get an insider's look at how the magic happens. It begins with the coating, where the secret formula gets added. First, we're going to put our flour in, now our seasoning blend. Chris could tell us what's in this spice blend, but then he'd have to kill us. The actual blend of herbs and spices is created at two different facilities. Half is created at one facility, half is created at another. It then gets shipped to another facility where it's going to be blended together so that that way none of our suppliers actually knows what our full recipe is. So we are very secretive about our secret recipe simply because every couple of years someone claims to have uh, discovered it. And the reality is there's no way they could have. There's only one print copy of our secret recipe. It is stored at a secret safe here in the building in Louisville, Kentucky at our headquarters. If it got into the wrong hands, who knows what would happen to our chicken empire. After the top secret spices are blended with the flour, in goes the chicken. I'm gonna mix it till it looks fairly incorporated. Our pressure fryer is what we're using to make our original recipe chicken. Uh, it is what the Colonel worked on in inventing. The Colonel developed a special pressure fryer based on a standard pressure cooker. Freshly breaded chicken gets lowered into a chamber filled with oil and then sealed in. As it heats up, the oil cooks the chicken skin rapidly and the pressure building inside the chamber seals in moisture that would normally evaporate in an open fryer. The result, a moist, juicy piece of chicken encased in a shatteringly crispy skin. It really creates a juicier product, and it sets our leaven herbs and spices really into it, and it, it actually expedites the cooking process. The original recipe fried chicken is a mainstay, but what's KFC cooking up for the future? We have an amazing innovation history. 
We're always innovating on new products like our new chicken sandwich. For our Kentucky Fried Chicken Sandwich, what we're gonna do is a very similar process as what we would do for our original recipe. Only instead, our chicken fillets are breaded twice for our chicken sandwich. Double breading makes the chicken extra crispy when it's fried up. And when it's ready, the freshly fried chicken goes on a nicely toasted brioche bun and gets topped with mayo and pickles. The future for Kentucky Fried Chicken is incredibly bright. We're constantly innovating to bring new and exciting recipes to our customers. As for exciting new fried phenomena here in the present, I got an order up for White Castle's Loaded Fries, a pile of French fries fresh out of the beast, covered in real bacon bits, melted cheese, and ranch sauce. Oh, that looks beautiful, Adam. Oh, look at that. Fortunately, the person who ordered these loaded fries was me. <laughs> so I'm going to take this order. Oh, the French fried fruits of my labor. The operative word being labor because of the ensuing food, baby. I recommend the loaded fries. Oh, my goodness. So, Adam, what are you feeling right now? Very happy. It's like so happy. Like, I can see that warm nacho cheese hitting you, Adam. You know what it is? We talked about how having a real egg really affects how good the breakfast sandwich is. Things like using real bacon affect how good the fries are. And just, I'm just going to run some tests, tests on these uh, in the back there. I'm going to just, just going to do some tests for like, just for like corporate uh, evaluation of toppings as related to the mass index. French fries. I'm going to go back there for a moment, but I'll, I'll catch up. I'm going to be I'm going to eat right. these. I'm going to eat these fries. I'll get back on the beef. <laughs> How much did Colonel Harlan Sanders get when he sold KFC in 1964? A quarter of a million dollars, two million dollars, or 20 million dollars? A finger licking answer when Modern Marvels returns. Not long after KFC became a franchise national brand, Colonel Sanders sold KFC for $2 million. Today, the brand is valued at $8.3 billion. The sizzle, the smell, the taste, the hamburger. It's an icon of the fast food industry and with good reason. On average, Americans eat up to 30 pounds of burgers every year. And of all the fast food burger joints you can think of, White Castle was the first. But I think now it's probably time to move further into the menu to arguably one of the most iconic foods in the American dining landscape, American fast food landscape, the White Castle slider. You're exactly right, Adam. We served over 600 million sliders every year. Ooh, I got to have accounted for at least a couple hundred of those. Well, I'll give you another stat. We've been open 100 years. We've sold over 20 billion in our history. That's incredible. The reason people have scarfed up over 20 billion of these magical bite-sized burgers is because of their taste, but also because of their value. And this was true from the very beginning. White Castle was founded in 1921 by Billy Ingram and Walt Anderson. The first White Castle location opened in Wichita, Kansas. The story behind the invention of sliders is that Walt Anderson had become so frustrated by the time it took to cook a meatball sandwich, he slammed his spatula down on top of a meatball and flattened it into a small patty, inventing the slider. Walt Anderson ran a small shop outside of factories in Wichita. And eventually, he opened a storefront called White Castle, in part because the building looked like a castle. The sliders sold for a nickel a pop, and they were extremely popular because they were cheap, affordable, and they were encased in these little buns that you could take with you wherever you want. Over the years, the price of the original five-cent White Castle slider has increased, but has always remained affordable. In the 1960s, you could get a slider for 12 cents, less than half the price for a cup of coffee at the time. By 1970, the price of the slider grew to 14 cents, about the same as a round trip subway fare in New York. And today, the average price of a White Castle slider is about 79 cents. You can get more than 10 sliders for the average price of a movie ticket. That's across 377 locations in 13 states, including the one where I'm about to make the slider magic happen. 
So here we go. First, we're going to do our buns, and we're going to take out a set of 30 buns. That's right, 30 buns. That's because White Castle's signature to-go box, the Crave Case, can hold up to 30 sliders. And the massive Crave Crate can house 100 of these puppies. In fact, the custom griddle that we're cooking on is specially designed to hold exactly 30 sliders at a time, maximizing efficiency. How fast can one of your workers set up 30 and put together 30? From beginning to end, I've seen team members do it in less than a minute. That is deeply impressive. Let's see if I can break that record. Just get under the whole front row. Pulling out a stack of 24 buns in one go is harder than it looks. Don't drop the buns, because they're precious. They are. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. This is not good. This is not. Oh, man, I'm so sorry. I am so fired. Oh, god. Oh, the humanity. Nope, no, no, no records will be broken today. In my defense, it's my first day. We'll just slide and add them like this underneath, break them at the back. That's your oh, row of 24. Come on. Just like that. And then we'll just grab a, a row of six. We're going to do 30 sliders on this first round. And the first step, grilling onions. Perfect. OK, it's so perfect. So now the next thing is our meat patties, 100% beef. Yes, sir. OK? So if you open that meat box to your left, that's right. OK. And, and then we're going to come over here with them, and then to the furthest part of the grill, start at the top, and just layer them down. Boom, 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 boom. Like that? Yep. These sizzling patties are the heart of the White Castle slider. But they wouldn't be the White Castle patties without those five signature holes in the meat. And there's a stroke of genius behind this design. When the slider patty hits the griddle, they're stacked on top of a layer of grilling onions. The steam from the onions gets inside the holes, circulating inside the patty and cooking it all the way through. Which means this is one burger you don't need to flip. This cuts down the time it takes to grill up a fresh batch of sliders. Ooh, now we're going to do the seasoning. Now, can you tell me what this is or no? That is a special blend just for White Castle, is so it really? I cannot indulge the secrets of that seasoning. OK, all right. So who knew secret special herbs and spices right here at White Castle? OK. After a gentle dusting, the buns go on top to get steamed by the hot onions and meat until they're ready to come off the grill. So now you've got the original sliders off. Yes, sir. Each one gets a pickle. You got it. And then we're going to box them up to go. But there's a problem. Oh, no. There's one without a box. Whatever shall we do with it? Hmm. Got an idea. McDonald's Quarter Pounder with cheese, Taco Bell's Chalupa, and Subway's Footlong. These are just some of the items on menus that have raked in over $50 billion in annual sales in the US alone. Every fast food spot has signature menu items. And at White Castle, it's this juicy slider. Oh my god. It feels like coming home. I called my mom, told her we were filming at White Castle. She began to share memories of how my grandfather loved it. And think about it, 100 years since the very beginning of the 1920s. How many generations have experienced this? Mm. It's true. White Castle has been serving its sliders for a century, making it almost as old as the broader definition of fast food itself. The history of fast food really starts off with the creation of the Automat lunchroom in 1902 in Philadelphia. Automat restaurants served customers ready-made food using vending machines. Horn and Hardart uh, built the Automat to create a way for people who didn't have time to sit down and eat a long lunch, commuters specifically. They were looking for quality meals very quickly and affordably. Automats weren't really automatic. There was an army of workers behind the walls of the vending machines cooking and replacing the food purchased by customers. So you'd enter the automat, and you would choose what you wanted to eat by inserting five cents into a slot and lifting a little glass window. And behind that window, you would have things like mac and cheese or meatloaf or pie. Um, and then you would 
go off to the lunchroom and enjoy your meal there. A decade after kicking off in Philadelphia, Horn and Hard Art leveled up by opening another location in one of the busiest urban centers in the United States, Times Square. Nearly 10 years after that, White Castle's birth kicked off stiff competition from more fast food icons like McDonald's in 1948, Burger King in 1954, and Taco Bell and Wendy's in the 1960s. This competition and inflation meant a decline in food quality at the automats compared to reliable fast food attractions like the Big Mac, KFC's fried chicken, and of course, the White Castle slider. This delicious hunk of joy is White Castle's main attraction, but they also make room for an occasional guest star, and I'm about to get a sneak peek at their latest menu experiment. So right now, we're going to be making two of our limited time only sandwiches, Okay. the Sloppy Joe and the Smoky Joe. For those of you who may not know, Sloppy Joe is usually ground beef, uh, seasoned with kind of a tomato sauce with vegetables. But it has like its own kind of rich flavor, kind of magical, tangy, somewhat spicy thing. Bringing in a ringer for a limited run is a common play in the fast food game. When you think about limited time menu options, LTOs is what they're called in the fast food world, you think of the McRib, which is the most delicious and most polarizing LTO in the world. The McRib made a big comeback last year. After a decade off the menu, it got its biggest release ever, selling in more than 10,000 McDonald's locations. Some LTOs are heavy on both creativity and calories, like KFC's donut and fried chicken sandwich, Wendy's breakfast baconator, or Taco Bell's nacho fries, which cost just a dollar and sold 53 million times in its first five weeks of release. Part of limited time offerings and the appeal of them is that they have this short shelf life. And so if they were on the menus full time, there wouldn't be this excitement about it. You would take it for granted. But there's always this shouting of something new and something fun and the gimmick of having something kind of appear on a menu and then disappear. And the difference between the Sloppy Joe and the Smoky Joe is... So we've got that uh, nice onion crisp on top of that Smoky Joe. Uh -huh. And we've also got that nice smoked cheddar cheese on top of that as well. Sounds delicious. We're going to take one scoop of our Sloppy Joe right. for each sandwich. One scoop on each? Yep. We're still just right on the bottom bun, yep. yep. And you're going <laughs> to do one more scoop on the other bun. Right. And you can just smell those flavors, Adam. It smells delicious. Just the bun top on top, and that's that's how you make the Sloppy Joe. That's the classic right okay, there. OK, right there. Right. And now we're going to do our Smoky Joe. Smoky Joe. So you're going to take one scoop of our crispy onion. Put it right on top? Yep. And then you should have that smoky cheddar cheese right on top, and then bun on top of that. And that is your classic Smoky Joe slider. Sloppy Joe and the Smoky Joe. Well, after putting in so much hard work, I am going to divest of my mask. That's awesome. It's so good. The same way I've been talking about how the fast food experience brings back memories, and you immediately go back to these memories. Sloppy Joe is one of those like beautiful memories of childhood, childhood cafeterias. And come on, admit it, it looks just, it looks like your childhood. If you had Sloppy Joes, and were fortunate enough to have good Sloppy Joes, oh, it was like, just like this. Mm. That was delicious, and that's the regular Sloppy Joe. But they also have that Smoky Joe. That's the most sticky guys go on 100 years. <laughs> It'll be your new favorite. Come in, have it, have it a lot so it's here often. Please, please, do it for me. This is delicious. I could stand here and quietly enjoy this smoky goodness all day but it's almost a little too quiet. I have to say, normally you'd have customers like hollering at you from one side. Right. Like I'm picturing like a dinner rush or a Saturday. Yes. We're only doing a drive-through and we're not even doing dining right now because of what's going on with the pandemic. That means all the customer action here is at the drive-through window. Thank you very much. Which is why it's my next stop.
You've been there, you're running late, you don't have time to cook, but you've got to pick up something, and fast. That's when you reach for that lifesaver of the American road, the drive through And today, it's my turn to take your order. This is Max. He has been watching me, like, dropping buns and trying to get it together with a great amount of patience. So, Max, thank you so much. But he, he's giving me one small crack on, on the drive through which I appreciate. Will you show me how we put orders in and stuff? Alrighty, so drive through This is my favorite position. When a car pulls up to the intercom outside, it triggers a motion sensor, which alerts the person working at the window. This is when the ordering starts, and it does not stop. You could be typing in one order, get, we're talking to another client, mm -hmm. talking to another client, and so on and so forth. Yep. Keep it going, keep it continuous. So you can save the order, take another car, save that order, take a third car, four, five. Once the customer pulls up to the speaker, yeah. it'll go ding. But you'll press this button right here, uh -huh. and you're activated on. What is the uh, reply, the standard reply that you're meant to give when someone pulls up? Our best reply is, welcome to White Castle. We appreciate your business. How can I help you? We appreciate your business. How can I help you? Got it. All right, so I'm going to try to like not mess up these things. Got to think very quickly. Heck be quick yes. on your feet. I, I hopefully I am. And faster than I can ask, would you like fries with that? Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Hello. Welcome to White Castle. We appreciate your business. May I take your order, please? The first system of drive-up service here might have started the very year White Castle was born. The pig stand was born in Texas in 1921 and it claims to be the first drive-in restaurant in the United States. And it was a barbecue place where you would drive up with your car and you would be served by a car hop. And that was the beginning of the model that eventually would become drive throughs With the big push for freeways in the 1940s, a lot of restaurants that weren't close to freeways sort of died off. And there was a need for families who were traveling on freeways to be able to pull off and quickly grab a meal. And by the end of the 40s, a major innovation meant you didn't need to wait for a car hop to take your order. What Jack in the Box did differently was it had a microphone that went to the kitchen. And so a driver would come up and deliver their order through the microphone and then drive up to the window and wait for the food. But the modern drive through experience isn't a one-sided conversation. What In-N-Out did in 1948 was create a two-way speaker. So that was another innovation at the time that we now know as something being very familiar to the drive through experience. Right now, I'm getting familiar with this experience from the other side of the window. But Max has some feedback. You got to remember, you're the first voice they're hearing when they pull up to that speaker. So you got to sell this White Castle brand. Challenge accepted. There's some really good sloppy joes, actually, that we have for a limited time, by the way. The smoky joe in particular happens to be really delicious. Yeah. I'm just saying, it's it's only here for a limited time, and I actually eat what we make here, and it's delicious. All right, let me have uh, two of sloppy joes. I'm a natural. All right, any sides or any onion rings or french fries, mozzarella sticks, something like that? The fries are awesome. The fries happen to be awesome. It's all about timing, though, legit. It's all about timing and not putting too much salt. I might make employee of the month, but there's no time to rest on my laurels. Hello, welcome to White Castle. We appreciate your business. May I take your order, please? Here you go, there's your medium Sprite. Can I get you any sausage? Because the orders keep coming. Hi, welcome to White Castle. Can I take your order, please? And coming. And two of the syrup with cheese. Right now, you should be making a small Chevy Coke. Copy that. OK, I'm ready now. Absolutely ready for you. What may I get you? Can I get you any sauces to go with that? Uh, no, I'm good. All right, you're good. Drive carefully. Nasty weather out there. All right, Craven. Bye-bye. Craven. on. <laughs> Team, how's Adam been doing since he's been here, right? Give him a round of applause. <laughs> I've worked up an appetite. <laughs> that was, it was oddly exhilarating. And Haskell is rewarding me with an exclusive treat. So Adam, we're going to take it back to the beginning. We're going to take it back to 1921, and we're going to make our 1921 slider. This was something that was on the menu back then, but it's also something to commemorate our 100th birthday this year. Is it available to customers? Currently, we've got it in two locations, Scottsdale and Chicago. We're going to make this specifically for you. This episode is only going to get better. You will get very hungry. 
Which of the following led to the nationwide introduction of the McRib in 1982? A national pork surplus, a shortage of chickens, or was it a sharp decline in Big Mac sales? The answer after the break. The answer is a shortage of chicken. According to a McDonald's executive chef at the time, when the Chicken McNugget was introduced in 1979, it was so popular, it led to a shrinking chicken supply. Helping franchises make up for this led McDonald's to create the McRib. Whether you're having McDonald's classic crispy golden fries or a Whopper right off the Burger King grill, it always tastes like it's supposed to. The reliable consistency of fast food is one of its hallmarks. In fact, when Shake Shack attempted to switch to fresh hand-cut fries, many people let them know how much they preferred the classic crinkle cut. But fast food also evolves, and at White Castle, the latest change is the introduction of the 1921 slider. Okay, so in the 1921, we're back at our griddle station. Right here, you can see we have the, the nice beef here, along with our nice roasted onion there. And wait, so the onions are already a little bit different because instead of going raw onion and steaming it right in the grill, these have already seen a little bit of heat. Yes. Got it. The patty here doesn't have the same signature holes as the regular White Castle slider meaning it has to be flipped. It's actually less efficient to make this. But what White Castle is losing in efficiency, they're hoping to gain in flavor. Take that seasoning. Now, this seasoning is different than the other seasoning we use. It is. This is the original. That's right. And this is the 1921 season. No doubt, also secret blend? That's right. OK. The spice blend and roasted onions are not the only things different in the 1921 slider. The meat for this specialty slider comes from a local premium beef supplier, but the original slider patties with the five holes come from a little farther away. We are here at White Castle Zanesville Meat Processing Plant, or as we like to call it, the providers of sliders. My name is David Reif. I oversee all of the manufacturing operations within White Castle. White Castle was started by my great-grandfather, Billy Ingram. A lot of Billy's friends called it his crazy hamburger experiment. And this is where that crazy experiment has led the company today. At this facility here, this is where we take beef trimmings, grind them, turn them into those delicious White Castle slider patties that you get to eat in our restaurants and at our retail products. Currently, the Zanesville meat facility processes 650,000 sliders a day, 3.2 million sliders a week, and 13 million sliders a month. The whole process begins on our loading dock. We get shipments of frozen ground beef in five days a week. Trucks come in bringing us frozen ground beef. We unload those trucks. We put about a quarter million pounds of beef a week through this freezer. All that meat gets thoroughly inspected before it's ground down, mixed, then ground down again. The slider meat is then pushed through a special mold to take shape. That meat horn is what gives it that wonderful square shape. Meat horn sounds like an edible musical instrument, but it's actually a sculpting tool, giving the patty its iconic look. This is where we get our two by two square patty with the five holes in it. If you look at these five rods right here, that's what creates the holes in our patty. The meat horn doesn't just poke holes. It also shapes the ground meat into blocks that get sent to a freezer. They're in there for 20 minutes. Gives us the perfect crust. So when we slice it, we get a nice even slice on our hamburger patty. Those slicers have the ability to slice up to 1,000 slices a minute. The finished patties get stacked, packed, and shipped out to White Castle restaurants to the tune of 156 million sliders a year, including a shipment that ended up right here. So now we take that slider press off. Oh, oh man, look at that. The patty has a char and a crispness that immediately sets it apart from the standard White Castle slider. Well, we're going to add our cheddar cheese. All right, the smoky cheddar? Yes, it is. Oh, so good. One of my favorite things on the menu. Standing here watching smoked cheddar melt on a burger, 
is definitely me and my happy place. Uh, now, that's perfect right there, Adam. We can take those off okay. and slide them onto our buns here. OK, you got it. Throw a couple of pickles on, and then we wrap up these drool-worthy sliders. All right, I am going to show one of these to the camera and then show the other one to the inside of my mouth. So, Adam, what do you think? That was so good, I nearly ate my glove. I was trying to put too much of it into my mouth. It is, flavor-wise, the perfect hybrid between a White Castle slider and a backyard burger. It has the char, the crispiness, the smokiness, even down to the onions and the cheese itself, that I would associate with a burger at a family barbecue but it has that unmistakable White Castle bun. It's really kind of amazing to see both of those flavors in one delicious package. It might take longer to whip up 30 of these bad boys, but man, is it worth the wait. 1921, it's both the year White Castle was established and the number of these you'll want to eat. My shift is over, my belly is full, and we got an exclusive peek behind the curtain at two of the fast food industry's titans from the world of burgers to the world of fried chicken, from working the line at the legendary White Castle to finding out why KFC is an international phenomenon. You can't tell the story of American food without also telling the story of the fast food chains and restaurants that help build and define it. So the next time you grab your burger, your fry, remember there's a lot of hard work, ingenuity, and technology to keep it at a fair price. And of course, fast.